Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. You join me with this beautiful view of Manhattan behind me. Absolutely splendid. So I'm on the Queens side where I live, and there you see there's Queensborough Bridge, and there's Roosevelt Island. If you remember the video I did, um, I apologize about that, the helicopters and all the rest of it. But yeah, if you remember the video I did from Roosevelt Island, it was right there. I'll do a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing the Casio A158W, and I'm wearing it, well, first of all, because I love it. In a moment, we're gonna go across the river to the AP store, and I'm gonna look at one of my Grail watches, and I wanted to see how they treat me wearing, <laughs> wearing a Casio. Also, at the end of this video, I will be uh, giving the details how you can enter a giveaway uh, uh, and win a watch. So stay tuned, I'll give details at the end. Now, I was planning to do this video a little bit later on, once I finished State of the Collection, uh, the next part is part four. I was supposed to do it now, but unfortunately I'm waiting for the pole router to come back from um, servicing. So as soon as that's done, I'll do part four. But in the meantime, I might as well discuss my long-term bucket list grail watches. These are all, uh, you know, high-end stuff. Well, I think, yeah, pretty much high-end stuff. This is kind of watches I dream about. So while I get on the train, let's change perspectives. A closer look at some of my... Uh, all-time top seven favorite grail watches. Number seven, and it is the Charles Frodsham, the long-awaited impulse chronometer wristwatch. Now, if you're familiar with my channel, me, you'll know that I inherited my grandfather's Charles Frodsham. Charles Frodsham is an English watchmaker of immense historic importance. Frodsham is the oldest continuously trading firm and manufacturer of chronometers in the world, which is quite an astonishing achievement. Uh, they were also a royal warrant holder and were very much active uh, in the heyday of English watchmaking. So to see this watch released in 2018 was a very big deal for me indeed. And rather sadly, it was completely ignored by the mainstream watch media, but it is unequivocally the most important release of 2018. And I did a video all about it. Um, it's not only important because of its just astounding beauty and elegance, I mean, done in a very understated British way, but also because of the uh, technological innovation going on inside. It features the double wheel escapement, which was originally invented by Breguet, which was then reinterpreted by George Daniels, famously included in the landmark Space Traveler, which sold, just to give you an idea, last year for $4.3 million. So this is available in solid yellow gold or steel, beautiful, um, ceramic dial uh, which at first I thought is the more traditional enamel but they selected it for its robustness so it, it, it does have some some modern qualities in it beautiful blue applied either Romans or, or Arabics that very much discreet British style it's it's super luxury but done in such a understated classy way that is just synonymous with, with English watchmaking even the decoration of the movement is quite restrained there's no overly ostentatious decoration the decoration is is all about subtlety but still the high degree of, of craftsmanship is absolutely amazing Unfortunately, to house this exquisite movement, it is in a larger 42 millimeter size. And of course, they're only producing 10 to 12 of these a year, which pushes the price right up. We're talking 60,000 pounds for the steel, 64,000 for the um, 18 karat rose or, or white gold. Yeah, definitely out of my price range, but unquestionably historically important return uh, for a brand that introduced me to watches that is so important to me personally. So I think it would be quite poetic to own this or at least um, experience it in some way. If they did release a, a smaller version, well, I'd be in a lot of financial problems. <laughs> Number six, we have a Patek Philippe, and it is a Calatrava, but it's not your typical Calatrava. This, a little bit of an oddity and highly overlooked, reference 5054J001 in yellow gold. It's a lovely little 35 millimeter. Patek is a brand that needs no introduction and has produced some of the most complicated mechanical watches in history. As you guys know, the Calatrava is an extremely prestigious collection. Its origin is in the early 30s. Most of the time we associate it with those 
very conservative, slender little dress watches. This is a little bit different. What I like about this is it really evokes the classicism of pocket watches with a few quirky characteristics that you don't typically see in a Calatrava. We have a turban crown, a really cool array of complications, including a moon phase, a date, and a power reserve, Romans on the dial. We have that traditional enamel dial. But what I love about this is you turn it around and we have a hunter style case with a hinged case back. You open it up and there you see the Caliber 240, which of course has the micro rotor, uh, wonderfully decorated. I love the idea of just popping it open and being able to enjoy that exquisite decoration. And it also has the benefit of leaving outside of the case completely devoid of any engraving. So you can therefore place either a special message or perhaps like my grandfather he had his family crest on his pocket watch i would probably do the same the lugs are very unusual almost trench style you could say what i like about it is uh, it's unusual it has something of an old world charm about it and considering the complications and i know some of you are going to probably roll your eyes but they go for about 20 25000 dollars on the used market yes that is a hell of a lot of money but for a patek for a calatravo an automatic with these complications i think it's actually quite impressive value for money it has a kind of distinguished air about it and obviously very very elegant okay at number five we have the universal geneve tri compax chronograph now you guys know of my admiration for universal geneve i've owned several of them it's an impressive history very much uh, desired and loved more specifically by watch enthusiasts not necessarily in the mainstream at one time universal geneve was uh, equally internationally regarded just as much as its neighboring genevan swiss makers like Adomar Piguet, um, Gerard Perigo Patek, even Rolex, specifically for its style of craftsmanship and also their in-house movements. Now you guys know I own a uh, the pole router designed by Genta and they have many iconic watches under their belt. The tri Compact is certainly one of them. Initially released in 1944 at Basel World Fair, the Tri actually refers to its combination of complications, not the dial layout. So it has a calendar, a moon phase and a chronograph. These have been famously worn by Eric Clapton, uh, Harry Truman and the sheer amount of different references different styles is quite bewildering and they can range from six seven thousand all the way to 20 and beyond the tri compacts continued from the 40s all the way into the 60s the latter ones being the more expensive and more in a sports watch style i really love the 40s ones i think they're absolutely gorgeous of course more conservatively sized one i'm drooling over on ebay is a typical solid pink gold version from the 40s i love the angular deco lugs which i must point out there's so many different variations those four sub dials it's just got a lot of balance yes it's quite busy there's a telemeter scale there's all there's so much going on but i just love the the, the fact that you get so much um, yeah, the, the movement, which is a manual wind, in this case, it's the Caliber 287, uh, isn't particularly decorated, it's quite plain Jane, but it is a column wheel chronograph, and let's be honest, this kind of amount of complications, if we were looking at a Patek or, or an AP or something, it would be astronomically high in cost I think you still get a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to you know a Swiss made complications heavy watch so we have a 12 hour chronograph there in a lovely 37 millimeter um, case beautiful patina dial there great conversation piece okay at number four it is the rolex explorer 1016 or more specifically the space dweller version you guys know that the explorer and i've said this a few times now is perhaps my favorite watch of all time and i've always loved the 1016 too and the regular 1016 is already uh, skyrocketing in price but the space dweller is something very special indeed now i actually discussed it in great length in my video on the rarest 
Rolex watches. But if you're unfamiliar with the Space Dweller, uh, let me just explain. So in the 60s, with the success of the Mercury 7, uh, NASA's project, Rolex wanted to honor these brave astronauts and kind of, I guess, you know, they are masters of marketing to cash in a little bit on the hype. We've got to remember, this is the darkest days of the Cold War. Uh, and these were very daring space missions. So Rolex wanted to rebrand the Explorer from the mountain going adventurer's watch to something a little bit more modern space age, you could say, and all the accompanying sexiness of that image. So they released it primarily exclusively to the Japanese market. However, it was a complete flop. So Rolex decided not to release it commercially worldwide and they just stuck with the 1016 as it was. And the result was a batch of explorers with Space Dweller written on a dial in a very limited amount and like so many of Rolex's more quirky watches has become extremely rare and sought after by collectors. Now I love the Explorer because it's very unpretentious. It doesn't have any of the obnoxious kind of luxury connotations many of the modern Rolexes have become. It's still a true tool watch and I just adore its simple balanced style. But to have one that is just that much more rare, even though it's only two words extra on the dial, we've got to remember this is a typical 1016, the caliber is the same, it's the um, 1560 in there, chronometer certified automatic, exactly the same, just with the addition of those two words. And I think the, the cool story behind it, probably the most under the radar, rarest watch you'll ever see. And at first glance, it might seem rather unremarkable, but to me wearing it, I would know uh, what it is. And I really like the appeal of that. Okay, at number three, it's another very straight to business tool watch. It is the Hanhart 417 Chrome. Now, Hanhart is a German manufacturer and specialized predominantly in chronographs, uh, especially during World War II. In the 50s, they took this expertise and released the 417. It's a flyback manual wind with a unicompax layout, clear Arabics in a lovely conservative 36 millimeter size. The second, the minute markings give a very functional precision, wonderfully complemented by the syringe style hands that very much is rather Zin 104-esque. I love its no-nonsense, tooltastic aesthetic, but what has really immortalized this watch in history is it being one of Steve McQueen's favorite timepieces. Now, Steve McQueen, the king of cool, uh, has made many watches famous. We only have to think of the Monaco, and of course, then there's his Rolexes, and, you know, not to mention the Benrus that I talked about in watches and movies, etc. But the Hanhart is probably the watch he wore the most, uh, especially when photographed off screen. And what is interesting, he actually starred in several films set during World War II, uh, wearing it. Of course, it was an anachronism, but it, it still kind of fit well because the Hanhart hadn't really changed that much. And it was believed that only 500 of these were ever made. So very rare indeed. And unfortunately, Hanhart's modern offerings uh, are much bigger and predominantly they have the Valjeux 7750. So they don't really have that mid-century proportions I find so endearing about the original. It has its quite distinctive coin edge bezel and featured in probably one of the most coolest photographs of the man himself. Uh, wearing, of course, another gentry favorite, his Purcells, while he sat on a sofa aiming a revolver. He liked to sport it on a bunt strap. But what I like about Steve McQueen is that he does have a timeless style about him. I mean, he's a very stylish chap. Obviously, stylistically, it's just very tastefully done. Now, I believe his was the chromed brass version. Some of them were also made in stainless steel. And there are some fantastic photographs of him actually using the chronograph complication uh, to time his motor racing. Okay, moving on to number two, and it's the Seiko Credor 40th anniversary Signo skeleton watch. So Credor is a brand that I haven't actually featured on the channel before. It's a high-end watch brand that is part of the Seiko group of Japan. Now. Credor was created to give Seiko Group a high-end watch brand to compete with the 
the best of Switzerland and Germany. But unlike Grand Seiko, which focused more on the technical innovation, Credo was more of a distinctly Japanese style. Their watches tended to be more traditional and classic in their styling. They even have a specialist watch studio where all the hand decoration is done. And, and this is something that's very cool about this watch is that you see these ancient Japanese motif. In this case, we have cherry blossom hand engraved. This watch was released to celebrate 40 years of the Creedor line. Uh, they started in 1974, so this came out in 2005. 14. Now there was a platinum version, but I really adore the yellow gold version. The engraving is done by master engraver Kiyoshi Turai. It's a wonderful little 37 millimeter and only 6.6 millimeters thick. So a perfect dress watch because it's so slender. Also it being skeletonized, you get to enjoy the caliber 6899 and is based on the 6800 series. This particular version was specially modified for this watch and made extra thin. So we have traditional blued hands and then we get to see the wheel train, escapement and balance wheel ticking away, beating away there. For me, it's the quintessential dress watch. Slender to slide under any cuff, uh, has an elegance about it, just simple two hands, horology decoration by a master craftsman. It is of a precious metal. I, I prefer the 18 karat solid gold version with a little bit of pizzazz, but not too much that it becomes flashy or obnoxious. But probably my most favorite feature of this watch is that it still has Seiko on the dial, which is a, a cheeky little Chichilian two fingers up at the watch snobs, those who, who often badmouth Seiko with such derision. For me, Seiko is one of my favorite brands of all time. And to have something of this ravishing and bewitching luxury made by the brand, it is unquestionably pure class. Now you can get these on the secondhand market uh, for around $5,000, uh, which I think is great value for money. Of course, the, the watch snobs will, will probably get all their knickers in a twist, but I kind of like that. You know, after owning so many affordable Seikos, the idea of owning a true luxury watch by them very much appeals to me. Okay, so at number one, it is, of course, the AP Royal Oak. Now, I've recently kind of fallen in love with Adama Piguet. Uh, I really respect their independence, their history of innovation, their technical ability, and somewhat has been overshadowed by their more louder offshore and all the rest of it of recent years. But the fact that they are still independently owned by the same family is quite astounding. What I like about the Royal Oak is that it does have a connection to British history as well. It's named after the famous ship. Um, now, there were eight Royal Oaks throughout the history of the Royal Navy, and that number eight is referenced also in the design, the octagonal case shape the eight screws, the octagonal crown, which I love. It's very much nautical inspired, although I would probably wear it as a dress watch. It's important because it was the first super luxury sports watch by a horology brand released in 1972 before the Nautilus, before the Overseas. This arguably was Gerald Genta's crowning achievement, in my opinion. Now, since uh, the 70s, it's exploded into, you know, all types of things with flybacks and minute repeaters and perpetual calendars, moon phases, you know, turbulence, all the rest of it. I just like the simple three-hander and even the two-hander. I find that tapisserie dial extremely alluring, especially in blue. The first one was launched with the Caliber AP2120, which was extremely thin, and of course in stainless steel. Uh, we got to remember back then, AP was predominantly known for their precious metal uh, more dressy pieces. So this was a real game changer. Luxury sports watches in steel are commonplace today. I mean, we don't even blink twice at it, but at the time it was super, super modern and just very, very cool. It still looks modern and contemporary. That is a testament to Genta's classic design, that it is timeless. And, you know, let's be honest, not all of Genta's designs have aged as well, but the Royal Oak definitely is still the icon. It always has been. So you can get it on a strap, but for me, I'd prefer it on the integrated bracelet with all those wonderful beveled edges and, and the contrasting finishes in itself separates it from other watches and was very much a hallmark of Genta designs. 
Okay, guys, so that is my top seven bucket list grails. It's over to you now, so please do share uh, your grail watches in the comments below. I'd love to hear what are your bucket list um, in the comments, please. So let's take it back to the studio. And we are back, we are back. Mm. And poetic timing because old poly, old poly, the, the, uh, the pole master, the pole, ma <laughs> the pole router is back. Um, so this has just got returned to me, literally was waiting for me downstairs after servicing. So a bit of a, a gentle day today. And I'll discuss the, uh, the AP visit in just a moment, but let's have a look at this. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Sticking away. The pole router, it is back. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that gorgeous? Look at that. Oh, yeah. So I can finally commence with part four of State of the Collection. Anyway, let's discuss AP. Um, let me bring up the specifications. So I went inside wearing proudly my Casio there. And to my surprise, well, I mean, I don't know why I should be surprised, but they were very polite, very helpful. I expressed interest in the Royal Oak. I sat down, I looked at all the new ones. I, I put a shot of me in the store so he, so he could see me in the store. Unfortunately, I totally forgot to take wristwatch checks, which is a bit uh, stupid. I didn't film in the store, obviously, because I think it's a little bit off. And to be honest, I just wanted to focus on the watches. Now, the the larger uh, ones were too big for me, but the 37 millimeter automatic, they only had the white, well, it's not really white, it's a silver dial, which is not my favorite. Actually seeing it in the flesh confirmed that. So this is the caliber 3120. It had an exhibition case, but absolutely gorgeous. It fit me like a glove. Uh, the size is perfect. And in fact, actually, just to give you an idea, I had on me uh, my Explorer in my pocket. I always have a secondary watch. So just to give you an example of the size, I put my Explorer next to it and I snapped a quick pick. It wears remarkably well because it's very slender. I think it's about nine millimeters tall. Now it is sixteen and a half thousand dollars. They didn't have the blue dial. They didn't have the gray dial, which is a real shame. There's a waiting list, which is Quite ridiculous. What is interesting is the price uh, on the secondhand market, or the used market, I should say, isn't really that much different. Uh, I, I almost would buy it new, you know? But it's a real shame they didn't have the 37 millimeter with the blue or the gray dial. The silver dial, supposed to be a white dial, but it's not really, I just don't like it as much as the gray or the blue. I gotta be honest. So even if I was ready to buy, they wouldn't have the one I, I wanted. Anyway, so. <laughs> Oh God, I don't know what to do. I think in conclusion, they were very, very friendly, non-judgmental about my wearing a Casio whatsoever. Uh, they were very polite, very professional. Shout out to Kevin who assisted me. The NY Boutique certainly gets the tick of approval from me. Am I gonna go for it? Not not yet. I, I think I'm gonna wait till next year. I still have a lot of saving up to do. I'm not quite ready to spend that much money. It is a lot of money for essentially just a three-hander automatic, but the bracelet and everything once on the wrist, yeah, it's definitely for me. It's definitely for me. So I don't know what to do. Um, I don't know what to do. One thing I will say is that the more expensive, you know, with the complications, I love the double balance skeleton dial. But what is interesting is that for me, they don't work on me. I love them as objects of art and craftsmanship, you know, especially all the ones with complications. Once on my wrist, I really feel that less is more. That's just my style, you know, less is more. So I think out of all the APs, it's, you know, I'm not trying to be a cheapskate or whatever, but, yeah, the, the, just a simple three-hander, even a two-hander, I'd be happy with. I just love that dial. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. In the meantime, 
I'm going to enjoy Old Poly. Old Poly is back. Stay tuned for... Oh, and I almost forgot. Oh, my God. I almost forgot. The, the, the giveaway, the competition. Well, to celebrate the arrival of the Catalina by NTH, we are giving away a whole bunch of prototypes. This is an international giveaway as well. Unlike the Tudor, unfortunately, my hands were tied because Tudor were... You know, it was their rules. Um, however, this time with Watch Gauge, we can ship... Uh, internationally which is fantastic all you have to do is go to the uh, link down below on the watch gauge website John shout out to John he's very graciously offered to host the competition and of course the Catalina will be or has been on pre-order with watch gauge I'm a customer of watch gauge uh, I bought the Nakin over a year ago and I was so impressed by the professionalism of John he had to be the guy to sell the Catalina um, so yeah, there'll be a link down below. I'll announce the winner hopefully in one or two weeks when, fingers crossed, the Catalina finally arrives. I'm very, very excited. I can't wait. Um, so good luck to everybody. I think there's about... I have two of the prototypes here. I think John has several as well. So it will be a, a handful of, of winners. Okay, guys, so I'm going to leave it there. Best of luck to everybody. Uh, entering into the giveaway um, thank you so much for watching please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful and as always guys i will catch you in the next one okay ciao this is a public service reminder for the good gentry please follow us on instagram join the facebook ugwc group and click on the bell to keep notified of new videos don't forget to keep it positive keep it gentry onwards and upwards thank you